Welcome everyone. Um, we're just letting people into the room. So it will start in about another minute as, um, as the room fills up. Okay, it is 7.02, so I think we can begin. Welcome everybody, my name is Avi Chomsky and I'm going to be the moderator tonight. And I would like to welcome you to our webinar on global repercussions, the Ukraine war, Russia and US-China relations. This webinar is sponsored by the Committee for a Sane US-China Policy, Massachusetts Peace Action and the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security. And as I was thinking about tonight's um, uh, goals, I was um, looking back at our mission statement at the Committee for a Sane US-China Policy, which says through information sharing and advocacy work, um, the Committee for a Sane US-China Policy seeks to prevent a war between the United States and China, to promote climate cooperation and to protect human rights in the United States and China. We seek peaceful solutions to conflictive issues. Obviously, the war in Ukraine is a conflictive issue and um, has made prospects for peace around the world um, look fairly gloomy, not only in Ukraine, but obviously the global repercussions as this webinar is titled, and certainly it also has implications for US-China relations. So that is what we are going to be talking about tonight. Um, our first speaker will be Michael Clare. Um, he is Professor Emeritus of Peace and World Security Studies at Hampshire College. And he's also Senior Visiting Fellow at the Arms Control Association in Washington, DC. He's the Defense Correspondent at The Nation Magazine, um, the author of 15 books on US military policy and global resource politics, including his most recent, All Hell Breaking Loose, The Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change. We will then hear from Dechun Ju, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Bucknell University, formerly Chair of the Department of International Relations, um, Director of the China, China Institute, and MacArthur Chair in East Asian Politics at Bucknell. Um, he's the author of over a dozen books on Chinese foreign policy, US-China relations, and the East Asian political economy. He's currently a Fulbright US scholar heading to Australia at the end of this month. And our third speaker will be Shihoko Goto, Director of Geoeconomics and Indo-Pacific Enterprise, Deputy Director of the Asia Program at the Wilson Center. Her research focuses 
on the economics and politics of Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, and US policy in Northeast Asia. She's also a journalist who has reported from Tokyo and Washington um, for Dow Jones and United Press International. She's a columnist for The Diplomat and a contributing editor to The Globalist. Um, and I am not an expert, um, I'm just the moderator, but I'm professor of history at Salem State University, um, specializing in Latin America and world history. So, Michael, would you like to take it away? Thank you. I'm going to uh, be showing some slides, and now we have to find them. And here they are. Let's see if I could get full screen here. It looks perfect. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to be with you. We're going to be talking about pretty serious issues, important issues tonight. And my job is to provide a little bit of the background uh, to what's happening. And in particular, I'll be talking about American foreign policy and, and, and the setting for the understanding the implications of Ukraine for US-China relations. And I'm gonna be throwing some quotations at you. And it's not because in an academic or scholarly sense, but I, I want you to grasp the, the thinking, the language used by the foreign policy elite, because a lot of what we're gonna be talking about is not policies set by the American people uh, or even their representatives, but by a very small uh, self-appointed elite in Washington, widely called the blob. Uh, so the basic points it, it, that I wanna make is that the US and China were already at a highly uh, increased level of rivalry and contestation before the war began in February, and the war has exacerbated that, that degree of contestation. And even though the US leadership is very much focused on Ukraine at the present moment, it doesn't mean it has forgotten its focus on China and continues to plan for rivalry and contestation with China. And one other point that in particular, we have to think about Taiwan because a lot of comparisons are being made between the Ukraine situation and the Taiwan situation. And I, I, I will argue that the outcome of all this is that the US determination to keep Taiwan out of China's grasp, as, it, as would be said, has grown stronger. So that's kind of the overview of uh, what I want to argue. Uh, so beginning with the, the rise of Mike, Pomp Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State in the Trump administration, but continuing without any break with the uh, rise of the arrival of Secretary of State Antony Blinken in the Biden administration, U.S. foreign policy elite, the blob, has viewed China as America's principal rival and has coalesced around the conviction that China's rise must be curtailed so that China could never overtake the U.S. in economic, military, and technological power. This is now total consensus on this view. So to give an example, I, I want you to be able to get the flavor of thinking. I won't read all of these. This is Nicholas Burns testifying, uh, the assumption that China poses the greatest threat uh, to the United States, claiming that it seeks to be the greatest power, China seeks to be the greatest power in Asia. No evidence ever being provided for this. It's just an assumption. 
and that we and our allies have to uh, stand up to China and, and prevent that from happening. This is, the, this is a good expression of the thinking of the foreign policy blog. And oh, this uh, outlook was in place before Russia invaded Ukraine, and it took several forms. First, the embrace of great power competition as the guiding principle for US military planning. Second, China, this, this is their term, the military's term, China as the pacing threat for US military planning, meaning that all US military planning is assumed to be around fighting a war with China. Everything else is secondary. Along with that, a vast increase in spending, military spending on advanced weapons and a nuclear buildup. Uh, fourth, the bolstering of US military alliances in Asia, particularly the Quad, meaning the quadrilateral alliance of the US, Australia, India, and Japan as a kind of quasi-NATO, a, a reappraisal of Taiwan as in a, not as some, something in between the US and China, but as something, as, as something that has to be pulled into our orbit. And the severance of global supply chains and so forth. So I'm not gonna be able to go into all of those in any kind of depth, of course. Uh, the notion of great power competition arose in the originally in the national security, national defense strategy document released by the Department of Defense in 2018, uh, crafted by Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, a former general, a Marine general. Um, and uh, uh, he, uh, he said that the, this new strategy makes clear, gives us guidance that although the Department of Defense continues to prosecute the war against terrorism, uh, long-term strategic competition with other great powers is now the primary focus of US national security. And that language continues to guide US military policy since then. Then this notion of China as the pacing threat for US military planning. Uh, and and uh, this is language used by, by Lloyd Austin, the sec current Secretary of Defense. Um, here you see it expressed. The department will pri prioritize China as our number one pacing challenge and develop the right concepts, capabilities, plans, and so on to maintain our competitive advantage and, be able, and to be able to defeat China in the war. And he, as he makes clear, this is a whole of government strategy and involves strengthening uh, our alliances. And a, a key component of that is the quad. Uh, some of you may have heard this term, uh, maybe you haven't. It's become very fashionable in Washington. Throw around the term, the quad. The quad is the quadrilateral alliance between uh, India, Australia, the US and Japan. Um, and uh, it's a dialogue officially, but is increasingly being used to lay the foundation uh, for a future NATO in Asia that would be intended uh, to seal off China, just as NATO and Europe is being strengthened, bolstered to seal off Russia and Europe. I want to talk uh, just briefly about where, how the thinking about Taiwan was changing before Ukraine conflict uh, under the one China policy that I think Ji Kun will speak about later. Uh, the US uh, considered Taiwan to be part of one China with the mainland, with the understanding that the relationship was yet to be negotiated. 
Uh, increasingly, however, American officials are, are talking about Taiwan in uh, different terms as something that's essential to US strategy. And you could see that uh, in testimony by Eli Ratner, the Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, saying Taiwan is located in a critical node within the first island chain blocking China and is critical uh, to the region's security and critical to defense of vital US interests in the Euro-Pacific, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific, I'm sorry. Um, and this is new language under the Biden administration and reflects a shift in thinking. So all of this uh, was happening when, when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. And uh, all, uh, all of these views were already in place, as I said. So how does, uh, how does the invasion affect this? I think it has reinforced and exacerbated or exaggerated all of this thinking uh, of the blob from before the invasion. I think it's particularly reinforced the blob's conviction that the United States and its like-minded allies, broadly the West, are engaged in an epic struggle, struggle and, and a long-term struggle for global domination with Russia, China, and associated states like Iran and North Korea. And this is seen as a geopolitical struggle, but also an ideological one, pitting democracies against authoritarian states. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is reflected in the new defense budget, which was released in April. Uh, it's a uh, $58 billion increase over the last budget. All of this going to weapons uh, aimed at fighting a war with China. So, that, uh, uh, as you could see, um, uh, China continues to be the pacing challenge around which US defense strategy is being organized. Something else that requires a longer discussion and I only have a few more minutes, uh, but I wanna mention uh, in case we come back to this in question and answer, uh, President Biden recently submitted to Congress a classified document, the nuclear posture review. Um, we don't know, we, we haven't seen the text yet, but from what's known about this document, it says that uh, the US retains the right to, um, to um, use nuclear weapons uh, in response to a conventional as well as nuclear attack, which, which is not what he promised in the campaign. It also calls for a buildup of the US nuclear arsenal. And this is bound to produce um, a, a, an acceleration of China's nuclear buildup and a new nuclear arms race with China, which is very frightening. I could talk more about this later. And so I only have two more minutes. Uh, uh, what I want to finish with is that uh, you see a, uh, uh, the U.S. is continuing its pre-Ukraine uh, commitment to view Taiwan as a bulwark against China. Um, the U.S. has continued its diplomacy aimed at creating an anti-China network around uh around China. And so to conclude, there are two competing visions for the future of the planet, the political future of the planet. And I, and I wanna leave with that so we could come back to it. On one hand, I think the blob foresees an epic struggle, an unending struggle that will consume, will, will 
govern all international affairs. Everything will be subsumed to this in their mind. And this is the language President Biden used in, in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, a, a month or so ago. Uh, we're in a new battle for freedom, like compared to the Cold War. And this will be a, we have to steel ourselves for the long fight ahead. On the other hand, China, uh, uh, representing by President Xi Jinping in a conversation with European leaders, uh, pleaded against dividing up the world in a new Cold War. He let us reject the resurrection of rival bloc mentality and oppose attempts at a new Cold War, a pleading with Europe to join China in opposing uh, this uh, blockification of the world. And I think those are the choices ahead of us and how this plays out will determine, I think, to a great extent, future politics of the world. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Michael. Um, and you were so um, punctual with your time too. So that was great. Um, and you also reminded me what I forgot to announce at the beginning is that the reason I'm being so strict with the speakers about the um, time allotted to them is that we wanna make sure we have time for questions at the end. So um, if you want to post questions as we go along, um, you should feel free to put them in the Q and A. And um, as after each of the speakers we're going to save all the questions until the end, but um, we will try to get to as many of the questions as we can um, after the three uh, panelists have spoken. So next is um, Jichun Zhu. Yes, uh, thank you, Avi. Um, it's always a great pleasure and honor actually to share the panel with uh, Professor Michael Clare and Mr. Jihoko Koto. Um, thank you, Michael, for offering an overview uh, for tonight's discussion or today's discussion, <laughs> depending where you are. Um, I'm going to cover uh, three issues. Uh, first, you know, how the uh, Russian-Ukraine war may affect China's worldview and policies. Secondly, uh, how might the Ukraine crisis affect the Taiwan Strait? And finally, uh, why I think are the United States and China doing the wrong things now? So first, how this may affect China's worldview. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, Western governments and media have described the conflict as that between democracy and autocracy. You know, China is not a party to the conflict and is not directly involved in it, but China is an undemocratic regime and has become an easy target in the dominant Western narrative about the conflict. Public discussions of the Ukraine-Russian war are not encouraged in China, but from social media postings, it is clear that the Chinese public views are very diverse, with some supporting Ukraine and others supporting Russia. And of course, it's the official perspective that matters. So how will the war affect China's worldview and policy? To answer this question, we need to understand how the Chinese government views this conflict. Now, I do not, come, uh, I, I do not pretend uh, to know what exactly Chinese leaders think about the war. Uh, all I'm going to say is based on my own observation and is certainly open to debate. So what does China see from the war? Number one, China sees a hostile West that is determined to defend its dominant dominant position in the international order and bent on confronting challenges to the Western dominated order. Number two, China sees a calculating West that is unwilling to get directly involved in a war with a nuclear power, but is actively fighting a proxy war to weaken Russia. Number three, China sees its own vulnerability to Western sanctions in a potential future war over Taiwan. Number four, China sees more challenges lying ahead in defending globalization and the international order based on the UN Charter. That order is not 
defined by the West alone. Number five, China sees itself a victim in the Western narrative about the war, as Western powers are conveniently shifting responsibility for ending the war to China. Now, such perceptions will have profound impact on Chinese policies. The Chinese view of the world has become more pessimistic, not just because great power competition has returned, but also because China feels that the West, especially the United States, will never treat China fairly and objectively. Like most countries, China puts its own national interests above any, anything else. China is not alone in taking a somewhat neutral position in the Russia-Ukraine war. China clearly has conflictual interests in the current crisis. It opposes war in principle, and it has reiterated respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. On the other hand, it also values Russia's geograph geopolitical importance. Beijing considers Moscow a critical partner in resisting the US efforts to counter China's rise. Many people in the West would like China to take a more clear cut position and join the United States and NATO to punish Russia and even defeat Russia. But this is wishful thinking. From Beijing's perspective, the Western countries are disingenuous where they ask China to put pressure on Russia. Those who claim China can easily change Russia's behavior is obviously overstating China's influence, ignoring Russia's agency and interests. The US government has exerted much public pressure, even thinly veiled threat for China to join the US led campaign against Russia, but has offered no enticements to China. The Chinese are suspicious of US motives. Some Chinese truly believe that the United States is going to weaken Russia through this proxy war so that the United States can focus on countering China later. As Miss Liu Xing, a well-known English language TV anchor in China, tweeted in March about US intention, I quote, can you help us fight your friend so that we can concentrate on fighting you later, unquote. Ms. Liu Xing's tweet seems to have captured some, how some Chinese view the US intentions. Indeed, when visiting Ukraine on April 25th, US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said, I quote, we want to see Russia weakened to the degree that it cannot do the kind of things that it has done in invading Ukraine, unquote. The Biden administration has continued to view China as the largest national security challenge, despite the ongoing war that Russia launched. The US State Department, uh, the Defense Department actually issued the 2022 National Defense Strategy on March uh, 28th, in which the United States continues to identify China as the major challenge, despite the war going on in Ukraine. Beijing therefore sees little hope the United States will be other than a country that tries to disrupt China's rise. That presents China with few incentives to pursue cooperation with the United States to tackle common challenges the two countries face, including the Ukraine war. Therefore, from Beijing's perspective, a weakened Russia is not in China's interest because then China will have to face a hostile West alone. Geopolitically, China cannot and will not abandon Russia. Perhaps China's somewhat neutral position, or some people call it pro-Russia neutrality, and its proposed uh, decrease of tensions and diplomatic solution to the problem are perhaps the most we can expect from China. Now let me move to the second point, which is about how the Ukraine crisis will affect the Taiwan Strait. Will China follow Russia's suit and take over Taiwan by force? Or as some people say, Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow. You know, indeed, parallels can be drawn between Taiwan and Ukraine, especially in terms of a young and a small democracy facing a giant authoritarian regime next door. 
But to assume that China will be like Russia and start war to conquer Taiwan is misleading. Actually, I think the Russian-Ukraine war has little impact on China's long-term policy towards Taiwan. First of all, China is not looking for an opportunity to attack Taiwan. China's policy toward Taiwan has been clear and consistent. That is to seek peaceful unification. And the Chinese do not fight the Chinese across the Taiwan Strait. Secondly, Beijing assumes that the power and time are on its side. So there's no need to do anything now. And Taiwan will return to the motherland when China becomes more powerful. So the unification of China and Taiwan, if it ever happens, is a long-term project. More haste, less speed. Finally, China's 2005 anti-secession law clearly outlines the conditions under which the military force will be used as the last resort to achieve unification. Now, Taiwan independence actually is the primary cause that, Taiwan, that Beijing will use non-peaceful uh, non means to uh, achieve unification. But Taiwan will not declare independence, ironically. Both the ruling party, DPP, and the largest opposition, KMT, believe that Taiwan or the Republic of China is already independent, and there is no need to declare independence twice. Ukraine crisis will certainly uh, make Beijing think twice whether it wants to use force now. But China's long-term policy of pursuing peaceful unification has not changed. Like everybody else, Beijing is shocked by the poor performance of Russian military, the world's second most powerful. Beijing is also surprised by Western coalition against Russia. So I think it is uh, Beijing will not put it itself in a vulnerable position now. And ironically, both Taiwan and China believe that uh, Ukraine is different from, from Taiwan, but for different reasons. Beijing believes that Ukraine and Taiwan are different because Ukraine is a sovereign and independent state and a member of the UN, and Taiwan is not an independent country, but a part of China. Many people in Taiwan believe that unlike Ukraine, which is left to fight a big power by itself. Taiwan enjoys close ties to the United States and Japan and other Western powers. And the United States has a law called Taiwan Relations Act to, def to help defend Taiwan. However, the fact that the United States is not doing much to help Ukraine beyond providing weapons and intelligence has weakened many Taiwanese confidence in the United States. A recent poll in Taiwan shows that only 34.5% Taiwanese believe the United States will come to help defend Taiwan. That's a 30% drop from October 2021. 55.9, that's 60% of Taiwanese don't believe America will come to Taiwan's aid. A 27% increase from the previous poll. The same poll also shows that 57% Taiwanese are not worried that China will attack Taiwan. Only 37% are worried. Indeed, the DPP government is not in interested in improving relations with China, but it has been very cautious of not provoking Beijing. However, some people argue that the United States is playing the Taiwan card against China, just like it is playing the Ukraine card against Russia. Some even suggest that Washington is girding China to fire the first shot in the Taiwan Strait so that the United States can get involved with some justifiable excuse. As Michael mentioned earlier, you know, US Congress has proposed and passed dozens of anti-China and pro-Taiwan bills in the past couple of years, directly challenging one China policy. Forget about the one China policy. The United States has a de facto one China one Taiwan policy now. And most recently, the State Department updated its online fact sheet about Taiwan and deleted, remember, deleted some key components of America's longstanding one China policy, including the United States does not support Taiwan independence and the United States acknowledges Chinese position that Taiwan is part of China. All those key components of one China are gone. Ken Lieberthal, a top 
China scholar who served in the Clinton administration as special assistant to the president for national security affairs and senior director for Asia, uh, US National Security Council, remarked recently in an interview, I quote, our policies toward Taiwan instead seem to be moving in directions that increase rather than mitigate the chances of military conflict across the street, unquote. The military industrial congressional media complex has benefited much from the Russian-Ukraine war. So they wish to start another war maybe for their own interests. Just think about it. If there is a military conflict in the Taiwan Strait in the near future, most likely it will not be initiated by Beijing and more likely it will be started by the United States, encouraged by Taiwan and also perhaps Japan as well. Now, finally, let me go to my third point, which is also the <laughs> final point, why I think the United States and China are doing the wrong things. The United States and China have squandered have squandered two major opportunities for cooperation recently. One is the COVID pandemic. The other is the Ukraine crisis. Unfortunately, both crises have deepened the distrust between the two great powers. The United States and China must ask themselves, what have I done recently to promote peace in the world? Both powers have failed to play the leadership role in ending the humanitarian disaster in Ukraine. Military budgets of both powers have been, have been growing. The United States continues to arm Ukraine with a stated objective of defeating Russia. In the Taiwan Strait, the United States provide, continues to provide Taiwan with small weapons while doing nothing to promote dialogue between the mainland and Taiwan. Meanwhile, the People's Liberation Army Air Force has been sending its aircraft to Taiwan's airspace on a daily basis. So both the United States and China seem to be preparing for war. Of course, Beijing needs to reflect on its policies and behavior and ask itself, why are the Taiwanese unwilling to unify with China? Instead of making it more, itself more attractive to the Taiwanese, Beijing seems to be pushing Taiwanese further away. Now, a war in the Taiwan Strait means a direct confrontation between the People's Liberation Army and the US military, two nuclear powers. And the consequences will be both unthinkable and unpredictable. It's a cliche to say the word crisis consists of two Chinese characters, Wei and Ji, meaning danger and opportunity. Out of this crisis, actually, it's an opportunity for the United States and China to work together to end the Ukraine war soon while, in, while improving bilateral relations at the same time. But that opportunity is being wasted in front of us. Ceasefire should be the top priority now. I think Xi Jinping should use whatever influence he has to persuade Putin to stop fighting now. Meanwhile, the United States should stop delivering more weapons to Ukraine, risking protract protraction and escalation of the war. China is the strong defender of sovereignty and territorial integrity in international affairs. It has also followed a non-aggression foreign policy but when Ukraine's sovereignty has clearly been violated by Russia's invasion, China has not come out and publicly condemned Russia, which has hurt China's international image. As China's, and China pledged to be a peaceful and responsible great power, that has been challenged as well. Did if China is not taking clear and clear stand against Russia, Russia's encroachment on Ukraine's sovereign, sovereignty and territorial integrity, how can China expect other countries to respect its sovereignty over Taiwan? On the other hand, the United States is seeking China's help and even pressuring China to sanction against Russia. It, is, it continues to view China as the pacing threat, as Mike also mentioned. It's waving sticks without showing carrots and it's rallying support for its policy to compete with China or contain China, depending on how you look at it most recently by hosting leaders from Southeast Asia to counter China's influence over there. So instead of grasping opportunities to promote peace, the United States and China are doing the opposite. I feel the prospect of US-China cooperation in the near future is very dim. So I will stop here and sorry to end my comments on this 
very pessimistic note. Thank you. Sorry to cut you off, but hopefully you will have a chance to say more during the Q&A because um, these were really important issues. Um, so please remember if you have questions to post them in the Q&A and we'll be getting to those as soon as our third panelist has spoken. And now we will turn to Shihoko. Thank you so much, Avi. And um, it's such a pleasure and, and great honor to be um, in this Zoom forum today. It's an exciting conversation and we've already covered a lot of ground, but I, I want to use my time, hopefully, um, keep my comments fairly short and make some points that perhaps have not been highlighted yet. Um, of course, the war, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine goes on, the war continues. Um, we don't know how and when it will end, uh, but it's already had a very significant impact, not just on uh, Ukraine itself or on Russia, um, or indeed, simply in the European theater, it has already had a considerable impact across Asia. It's impacted Russo-Chinese relations, China's relations with other countries within the um, Asian Pacific, Asia Pacific region. And also it's changed relations too amongst Asia's middle powers. Um, what we do know amongst a lot of uncertainty that continues um, at the moment um, is from a Washington perspective, um, there is greater unity now um, on the political front within the United States when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, to support Ukraine is to be American. Um, it is a very patriotic act. Um, and it's, it's not unlike um, a anti-China stance uh, that the United States has adopted to. So we face a Congress that is very divided, a country that is very divided. Um, and on issues of foreign policy, there is a great deal of division. But when it comes to issues like Ukraine and China, there is, it does become the source of the country actually coming together. Um, it has also been an opportunity uh, for the United States to bring the international community, at least of industrialized countries, together. In short, um, the United States has really come back or wants to project itself as a global leader, willing to and wanting to project American values and um, most notably democratic ideals and the rule of law in particular onto the global stage. Um, and you know, amid all this uncertainty, of course, is what the relationship between Beijing and Moscow will be uh, shortly before the invasion uh, by Russia on, onto Ukraine. Uh, Beijing and Moscow have made overtures of mutual support. Um, and that has really changed expectations, um, not just about Russia, but also about China. Um, it is clear now that China is no longer fearful of upsetting the West. They, Beijing was clearly um, aware that any overt alliance towards uh, Russia, whether, even if it's simply a verbal one, um, under the circumstances, under the drumbeat of war that Russia had been doing, um, that was a clear provocation and they were prepared to, to move ahead with that uh, partnership. Um, but what we do know is that um, China since has backed off somewhat from its uh, verbal support and commitment to Russia, we actually don't know to what extent Beijing is going to be able or even willing to put its eggs in the Russia basket. And I would argue that it's actually moving far um, more away and, and reluctant to be partnered or be in alignment with Russia. And certainly, as uh, Shikan said um, earlier, each country, um, the United States, China, and all other countries um, act in their own self-interest. And it is clear that China, if it continues to align too closely with Russia, it is not necessarily in its own national interest either. So let's move on to the unknowns where there are more questions than answers. Um, one of the questions that arises in the Indo-Pacific is that uh, whether or not the United States is taking on a more Eurocentric approach, that it is focused much more on the European theater. Uh, later this week, 
President Biden will actually be heading to um, East Asia. He will be going to South Korea to meet with the new, newly uh, uh, elected South Korean President Yoon. Um, after that, he will be heading to Tokyo for um, not just a bilateral with Japan, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida, but also for a quad, uh, a quad meeting, uh, a summit meeting with uh, not just Japan, but also India um, and Australia as well. So certainly there is this optic, um, uh, an opportunity to, to uh, visualize this American leadership um, in, in um, Washington actually taking the lead amongst these many challenges that the world is currently facing. But is it actually going to have substance? Is the United States actually back, going to back up and, and provide you know, um, things that would actually ensure that it continues uh, to be engaged in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, there is this assumption that the United States will find it incredibly difficult to engage on multiple fronts, especially, and there is great concern too that uh, once the Biden administration is out of office, that kind of appetite to ensure um, that the United States does continue on this multiple um, front in foreign policy uh, will wane. Um, there is also this question about the strength of the Quad itself. Uh, we have already seen that India had actually not been in alignment with the United States when it came to uh, the United Nations and pushing and, and uh, uh, pushing back against Russian aggressions. But it is worth pointing out that India was hardly alone. We are seeing a clear divide between those uh, industrialized countries. Uh, which are more supportive of the United States and those that are not. And it is the emerging markets that actually make up the bulk of the global population. And I should also point out that when it comes to foreign policy strategy, China has been much more effective in reaching out to emerging markets. As I said before, um, the China strategy when it aligned with Russia was to really be able to uh, push back against the G7 and industrialized countries position on Russia, uh, but it is really moving ahead with reaching out to um, uh, potential partners um, in Africa, in um, Latin America, and increasingly in Southeast Asia as well, and that trend is expected to continue. Um, another unknown is um, this uh, position about Taiwan. Now, um, Xi Kuan has made a uh, has argued that the United States has become much clearer, um, going moving away from strategic ambiguity and strategic clarity, and really siding with tai, um, Taiwan and the Taiwanese government in in order to push back against uh, Beijing. Um, but I would actually argue that the Ukrainian situation has shaken a lot of confidence um, on the part of, of Washington and Taiwan's ability to stand on its own two feet. Why do I say that? One of the repeated arguments I hear um, from on Capitol Hill is that there is concern that the Taiwanese won't fight like the Ukrainians. It's remarkable that Ukraine has been um, um, President Zelensky has really inspired so many people across the world um, because of his pure, you know, his sheer charisma, of course, but his and also his ability to use social media and to reach out and connect to people well outside of his own borders and really bring a sense of urgency about the crisis situation that Ukraine is finding itself. Um, there is also, but at the same time. There is concern in the United States that that kind of emotional and national um, you know, uh, resilience will not necessarily be found in Taiwan. And of course, one of the problems that we are going to face is uh, the big disinformation campaign that China has had continue to bombard Taiwan on to really rattle the confidence of the Taiwanese people themselves, not just um, to shake their own confidence, but also to shake the confidence uh, that they may have regarding the United States and the US commitment to protect Taiwan. 
as well. So uh, what is the way forward amid all these uncertainties, um, amid the limitations of the United States and engaging as a, as a power, as a global power um, that wants to stabilize the world? Um, the impact, again, uh, that Ukraine has had on the global order is quite significant. Um, one of the biggest issues that it has really led to is a questioning of deterrence. Um, if we are already to talk about you know, lessons to be learned from the Ukraine experience, is that Ukraine had given up its nuclear ar arms. Um, had it been a nuclear country, um, had it possessed nuclear weapons, would it have faced the same kind of situation that it finds itself? Would, it, would Russia have, would, um, would it have staved off Russian invasion? One of the lessons that many countries are drawing is to say, yes, yeah. Um, had Ukraine had nuclear weapons, they would have not been invaded. And there is this reassessment of this idea of deterrence and nuclear security in particular um, across the world, including in the Indo-Pacific and in Asian countries. It's also led to rethink in Asia about collective security um, with or without nuclear weapons. One of the issues that's really being bandied about is this potential of nuclear sharing. Um, but it's also led to an idea of, is, the, is it going to be possible to have an Asian version of NATO? The short answer is really no, but at the same time, there could be some kind of emergence of a network of like-minded countries that would uh, coordinate much more strongly, that goes beyond the hub and spoke uh, system that is dominated by the United States at the moment, to have a network that is focused on collective security and defense. Uh, one of the other things that we have learned from Ukraine is that it's actually changed the nature of warfare as well. Bear in mind that neither the United States nor Europe are actively engaged um, in military conflict with Russia at the moment. Uh, NATO is not um, engaged um, in taking action against Russia. But what we do know is that there has been collective action, not just in supplying arms to the Ukrainians, but we've had this all out economic warfare uh, towards uh, Russia. And it has been had a crippling effect on Russia, but at the same time, uh, it, the sanctions, especially since it, it is not completely um, uh, limiting Russian exports of natural resources, uh, it has had a significant dent, uh, but it has not completely crippled the Russian economy. So it has changed how we think about economic statecraft and the nature of warfare itself. And I think that is going to be an, an issue uh, that will continue to dominate the conversation as we look into the possibility of you know, what can we learn from the Ukrainian experience. Um, and then thirdly, as I mentioned before, there is this growing divide between industrialized and emerging markets that is occurring um, as a result of Ukraine. We saw it at the United Nations. Um, and we are going to see it on more multiple fronts as um, the United States is, in particular has a limitation about being a leader. What are some of the incentives that it could provide to emerging, market, into, to emerging economies uh, to incentivize them, to align themselves with the United States um, at a time when it could create hostile, hostile relations with both Russia as well as China? Uh, that is not clear at the moment, but we do know that there are formidable risks facing those emerging markets. Uh, we here in the United States have already felt the impact of you know, supply chain disruptions, as well as the disruptions caused uh, by the Ukraine, Ukrainian crisis. But that pales in comparison to the experiences of surging uh, food price concerns about food security and energy security that is faced um, in some of the um, uh, poorer countries in, in the world as well. Um, there is also this question about uh, the need to hedge 
militarily, that the United States over the last uh, few years in particular has not necessarily been the most reliable of partners uh, for uh, countries. And so um, we are going to see more um, hedging on the part of um, emerging markets um, to uh, be able to um, uh, have options uh, that are not necessarily completely dependent on the United States. So I see that my time is up. Uh, so let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we have quite a few questions. And um, fortunately, we still have 35 minutes. Um, thank you to all of the panelists for your really interesting and um, insightful and really complimentary uh, presentations. So um, let me pose to you some of the questions that are up here. The first one, um, I think will be a very quick one from Jacqueline Cabasso from Michael. Um, can we get access to your slides? Don't forget to unmute. There we go. Uh, well, this is this has been recorded, and it'll be it'll be available on our website. Yes. Okay. So that's the answer to that. Um, and I would suggest that the panelists just remain unmuted now, so that we can move more quickly from question to question. Um, Joseph Gainza asks, how has China responded to Russia about its invasion of Ukraine? So Jichun, do you want to take that one? Okay, I'll take a step. <laughs> um, and you know what, let me ask the next question for you also, maybe you can answer them both together. Um, from Michael Vongeren, uh, what are likely steps China might take to defend itself against potential US economic sanctions? Okay. Um, I'll be brief, then Michael can elaborate, I guess. <laughs> um, so I think the, the Chinese official position is, is, uh, is neutral, you know. Um, on the one hand, you know, China has reiterated its respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and called on upon both sides to, uh, you know, stop fighting and uh, find a diplomatic solution. On the other hand, you know, uh, of course, China has this strategic relationship with Russia. Uh, before, you know, everybody knows that before the uh, invasion uh, was started, you know, Putin was in Beijing and he and she touted the relationship as uh, uh, the one without limits, right? Of course, later on, you know, the Chinese side clarified the position. The relationship, the relationship may have no uh, ceilings, but it has the bottom line. The bottom line is the UN Charter. And obviously Russia's invasion has violated the UN Charter. So China is against it. But the, of course, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we cannot expect China to uh, you know, step up and publicly condemn Russia because that's not in China's interest. Uh, but I think the official position is, is, is neutral. And some people may say it's kind of pro-Russia neutrality, you know, but then that's the, most we can expect from China, I think, you know, for all the reasons I mentioned also earlier. Uh, for, for the second part, the second question, how China is, is going to, you know, how China is prepared for these potential Western economic sanctions? I, I think, you know, um, first of all, I think uh, China is different from Russia, you know, because Russia's economy is much smaller, you know, and it much less integrated into the international system. China's economy is much larger and also remember, China is the largest trading partner of, of some over 140 countries in the world. And most US allies uh, trade more with China than with the United States. So it's going to be difficult to form this kind of a Western you know, coalition against China. I, think, I don't think it's going to happen actually. If there's going to be sanction, you know, it's going to be on a much limited scale. Secondly, I think China, yes, China is, I mean, way before the invasion of Ukraine, China has been kind of preparing for uh, the uh, trade war between China and the United States. Uh, we all know this concept called the dual circulation, you know. So China is ex uh, expanding its domestic market, you know, promoting domestic consumption as a way to promote economic growth and, uh, and, uh, and find new destinations for investments. But also at the same time, China is also expanding trade and the economic cooperation with non-Western countries. Remember, 
ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries, actually is the largest trading partner of China now. Last year, the trading trade volume between China and ASEAN, I think hit uh, over $880 billion, you know, larger than China U EU trade and China US trade. So China is expanding uh, economic cooperation with non-Western countries also as a way to diversify its economic relationship and investments. So I think I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be worried too much about whether China is going to uh, you know, handle these uh, sanctions, uh, you know, if that happens. Um, I'm sure that the Chinese government is, uh, is fully aware of the, uh, the, the risks uh, involved uh, in, in the future war. And I'm, I'm sure they are, you know, doing everything possible to prepare for that. I'll stop here and Michael probably will expand. Thank you very much. Well, there are more things I could say, but I know there are other questions. Just one, one quick point uh, I'll, I'll make it, is that um, officially China is not, uh, it, it, it is not saying that it's, it's going to submit to US pressure to uh, impose or to, to uh, abide by US sanctions on Russia because that would be humiliating. But in practice, it appears that China is abiding by US pressure um, and is, is not cooperating with Russia to, sell, to acquire excess uh, Russian energy and the like. Uh, and I think this reflects an appreciation of Chinese leaders uh, that in fact, uh, the West can impose harsh economic punishments on China if it sought to do so. And at, at a moment when the Chinese economy is uh, a little bit shaky, uh, there's no desire to put that to the test. So in fact, China is being quite cooperative, although not saying it's doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Annette Brownlee. Is the United States likely to try to use its quad partners as cat paws in pressuring China or to focus on Taiwan defense as a talisman issue? I don't know if Michael or Shihoko wants to say anything about that. Can I just say briefly, um, Taiwan is a issue that divides. It does not unite the quad. Um, we've already seen a divide within the four um, quad countries regarding Russia. Um, when it comes to Taiwan, um, one of the ironies is that whilst the United States has this um, strong um, rhetoric about defending Taiwan, protecting Taiwan, um, it has really <clears throat> been reluctant even to have a trade agreement with Taiwan. Um, why is that? It is because um, once you once the United States does that, then it is seen very much as a mechanism to um, push back and alienate China. And other countries, especially across Southeast Asia, don't want to sign on to something that they see as quite toxic because it would jeopardize their relationship, their economic relationship with China. Um, and as has been noted for, you know, for all countries um, in the Indo-Pacific, with the sole exception of Afghanistan, uh, it is China, not the United States, that is the biggest um, you know, trading partner. So if they can't even do that on the economic front, how can you do it on the security front? Okay, thank you. Um, from Phil Nichols, given the limited and non-renewable resources like lithium, isn't the US action regarding Russia and China intended to stop their access to these resources, for example, Belt and Road, and take them? And if so, doesn't that logically mean that the United States will press Russia and China until either they give up or we have World War III? Maybe this one goes to Michael. That's a complicated question. And I'd love to spend a lot of time and pick it apart and do different parts of it. Um, uh, the biggest consequence of, of uh, the sanctions on Russia uh, is, uh, remember Europe is highly dependent on, was highly dependent on Europe for energy. Uh, something like 
5% of natural gas imports in Europe came from Russia and a lot of it's oil and coal. So one of the things that's happening under US pressure, but from the NATO leadership as well, is the aim of the EU is to go to 0% Russian energy imports. And this is going to reconstruct the world's energy order because it's going to energy is going to have to come from somewhere else. Uh, a lot of that's going to come from the U.S. in the form of natural gas, which means instead of going in a green direction, we're going to a fossil fuel to more fossil fuel production in the United States. So, so there are so many consequences of all of this. Uh, the struggle for lithium and other materials needed for a green transition between the US and China is very much on the mind of US strategists. In the legislation that she couldn't uh, refer to earlier, the uh, US uh, Strategic Competition Act, something like that, uh, calls for a US uh, uh, U U.S. Um, government subsidies to to uh, ensure that the U.S. dominates the production of these rare earths and other materials uh, specifically to compete with China. So this could be a future source of conflict in, in, in Africa and elsewhere. I have to stop because I know of time, but it's a fascinating question. Um, so there hasn't been much very optimistic talked about tonight, but maybe this next question will allow um, one or more of you to um, turn the conversation in a slightly more hopeful direction. Um, we have a question from Brad Wolf. What confidence building measures could be initiated between China and the United States to decrease mistrust and create cooperation? I'll start and hopefully other people will follow because uh, one, one area that we watch very closely at our website, um, the same US China policy.org, that's uh, the committee's website. We have a whole page uh, devoted to provocative maneuvers. Um, Xu Kun re re uh, referred to that earlier. Uh, uh, on both sides are sending in, this, in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and around Taiwan. Almost daily, there are Chinese uh, aircraft fly towards Taiwan and provoke the scrambling of, of Taiwanese jets. At the same time, the U.S. is sending its ships close to China in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait. These are very provocative and dangerous because they could produce a, a spark that would start a war. So a very important confidence building measure uh, would be uh, to, uh, to mutually agree to scale back and end these kind of provocative maneuvers and, and to create a hotline and other measures to prevent a accidental clash at sea. Thank you, Michael. Um, Jichun or Shihoko, do you want to um, make any further comments on um, things that the United States and China could do to reduce tensions? If I can, I know, I know she can, can has much more, but if I could just add one thing, two things. Um, when the Biden administration came into office, there was a lot of talk about, you know, um, having drawing a line and competing and challenging China when it was necessarily necessary, but also cooperating with China on cross border issues such as climate change. Um, and but we've also had this biggest uh, cross border challenge to date, um, the global pandemic, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, cooperation. And in fact, there's been a lot of finger wagging and a lot of ill will on both sides. Um, so that is a cause of pessimism. However, um, one of the things that I do think plays to America's strengths, and I'm not just saying this because we're, I'm on a panel with academics, 
Uh, but one of America's biggest strengths, I think, is its higher educational system. And I think this whole idea of grassroots um, people to people exchange uh, has actually managed to remain strong. Um, it's actually expanding beyond the university level and going to the high school as well as like the um, middle school level as well. Xi Jinping's own daughter went to Harvard, right? Um, so yes, there is a lot of concern about um, the technology competition and limiting visas and opportunities and access for Chinese researchers. Um, but at the same time, the door appears to be open uh, for Chinese students to learn about, uh, uh, to come to the United States, especially in the liberal arts. And so that gives me quite a lot of hope. Thank you. Jichun, did you want to add anything? Sorry, I had poor connection just now. So what, where are we now? Um, what could the United States and China be doing to reduce tensions? Yeah. Well, if I can just add, I, I heard most of the Michael Shihoko's uh, comments, you know, but I think, you know, there are really a lot of things <laughs> the two sides can do, you know. Uh, there are even many like, so-called low hanging fruits out there to pick, you know. I think uh, Joko mentioned educational exchange. I mean, that, that's an area that definitely the two sides can work to build, rebuild trust, you know. Uh, I mean, Avi mentioned, you mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm heading uh, for Australia for my <laughs> Fulbright program, but I can tell you, <laughs> to reveal a secret to you, you know, I, I, I was planning to go to China, Taiwan, and <laughs> Hong Kong, you know, but then of course, uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Trump you know, terminated <laughs> Fulbright program <laughs> in China and Hong Kong, you know. So, uh, well, he thought, you know, that, that's a punishment for China, but he didn't realize that actually Americans benefit equally, maybe even more from this program, you know. So for, for President Biden, you know, just restore the Fulbright program and expand such cultural exchanges, education exchanges, that will build some, uh, you know, confidence between two sides. Another thing I'm not sure whether it was mentioned or not, you know, North Korea, you know, don't forget North Korea, you know, uh, with the new president in the South, North Korea is, um, is going to do something you know, in the next few weeks or months, you know, and uh, that issue has been kind of ignored with the, what's going on in Ukraine and uh, between China and the United States. But remember, United States and China do share common interests in denuclearizing North Korea, and I think the two countries should resume a dialogue on that critical issue. There are many things to, to do, you know, to build confidence. But I, I'm afraid, you know, and I, you, you say you want us to kind of cheer up, you know. <laughs> but I, but I, 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 again, at the end of the day, I, I still feel pessimistic. But I think, I think both sides know that they can do a lot of things to rebuild this relationship. But the problem is both sides lack incentives, uh, you know, to, do, to, to move forward. And they, you know, they, they don't feel, you know, incentivized or encouraged to do anything. Um, and that's the real challenge, I think, you know. Anyway, I'll stop here, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe getting a little more pessimistic again, um, another question from Joseph Gainza. Um, how would a Republican win in 2024 affect US policy toward China and Russia? Hmm. Now, who's the expert on that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pointing at you, Michael. Well, uh, you, you know, Shohoko uh, spoke of this earlier, uh, uh, alluded to this earlier, uh, when she said that there's uneasiness in Asia that, uh, th that a Republican administration would not uh, would not put so much effort into building U.S. ties in Asia and in Europe and uh, expressing that kind of leadership. So maybe uh, we will ask her to elaborate on that. 
Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, Trump's, the Trump administration had, was received um, in, in a mixed bag of ways uh, because the foreign policy of the Trump administration was very anti-multilateral, but at the same time, it made, it, it made clear a very hawkish US stance towards China, which a lot of Asian countries, especially Japan, welcomed. And in Japan, there was a lot of concern that a Biden administration would go all soft on China. So the fact that there is this continuum between the Trump administration to the Biden administration to, be, to take a more hostile stance towards China has been appreciated in Tokyo. Now, the problem with a, um, a, a Republican win post Biden is this, that although the United States may continue to have a hostile towards, stance towards China, it could also revert back to a much more unilateral, um, unipolar worldview that actually not only is hostile towards China, but also hostile towards its traditional allies um, as well. Uh, the, the Trump administration had imposed tariffs on aluminum and steel, not just on China, but on Japan and Korea and other countries as well. It has still not been lifted by the Biden administration. Um, if there is a more a return to a more um, nationalistic uh, Republican leadership, there is concern that there would be you know, this, this whole idea of uh, national self-interest really uh, over prevailing over any collaborative efforts, um, even when it comes to dealing with like Ch China as well. So that's one of the concerns that a lot of Asian countries have at the moment. So Steve Gallant asks a question. Um, do all panelists agree that China is in no hurry to take in Taiwan? And I think he was responding to um, Jichun's comments um, that China was in no hurry. So maybe I will ask um, Michael and Chihoko to, to contribute what they think about that. My thoughts are a lot in alignment with what Chihoko has said. Uh, I've been looking at the military press and including the military, US military interpretations of the Chinese military press insofar as there's been commentary publicly. And as he suggested, uh, quite a bit of shock over uh, the poor performance of Russian forces in Ukraine. Um, uh, because, and remember, this is an invasion, and you have to be able to deploy large number of forces and, and to move a lot of equipment and accomplish all kinds of missions. And uh, this is what China would have to do if it invaded Taiwan. And clearly, Russia did a very bad job of this. Uh, and it should be noted that Chinese military doctrine and Chinese equipment and Chinese training is closer to Russia's than, than, than to Western modes of fighting. So uh, it, its troops are trained and equipped to fight the way Russians are trained and equipped to fight to a, a considerable degree. So uh, they have the, the military leadership in China has to be saying to themselves, we really have to rethink everything uh, uh, because it, it, uh, also it should be noted that the US was publicly broadcasting intelligence long before Russia invaded of what was gonna happen where the fort, you know, uh, and clearly has the, would have that ability to, in the case of China, if China was mobilizing for an attack on Taiwan. So uh, if, if I were a Chinese general in there or, or a admiral, I would say, we have to put off any thought of invasion for a long time and, and rethink everything, our military doctrine, our equipment, our training, and start all over. So I would say this is a deterrent.
Um, Chihoko, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't. I don't want to go on this pessimistic streak, but um, time is actually not on Taiwan's side. Um, China, although the sense of you know immediate invasion may have been um, may have gone away. Bear in mind, before the Ukraine situation, um, there was a lot of talk on on Capitol Hill about a, a, an imminent um, invasion of the PLA onto, onto Taiwan. That has gone slightly been toned down uh, because of the, you know, the lessons to be learned from the Russian experience in invading Ukraine and how that is impacting the Chinese leadership's idea of you know, it's not going to be a cakewalk. Um, but looking at it from Taiwan's perspective, Taiwan still remains incredibly vulnerable. Right now, uh, there is a lot of attention being paid to Taiwan by you know, not just by foreign policy experts, but the world at large because of the critical role it plays in supplying uh, in the global supply chain, most notably in the semiconductor sector, it dominates in that industry. Um, but given that so many other countries, including the United States, including Japan, South Korea has certainly stepped up its own um, semiconductor you know, production, the, the big advantage that Taiwan has is going to quickly uh, shrink. Um, and so it, that does leave it economically vulnerable. Um, it's also under, as I said before, under constant attack from disinformation campaigns from, from China, uh, which is not ebbing at all. So there is that psychological warfare. There is this economic vulnerability that Taiwan has. Um, and whether the global community is going to be mobilized to ensure that it does not falter any further uh, remains to be seen. Um, question from Nydia Leaf. Do the Quad or other countries comprehend how shabbily the United States government treats most civilians while throwing billions into war? 140 million in the USA are poor or low income. Suicide rates are an epidemic, according to the New York Times. Childhood depression is at record numbers. California, our main bread basket, bread basket is in the 23rd year of a drought. Do other nations know these statistics? I'm sure many Chinese know that actually, because the Chinese government would publish those statistics and the data in it to show that, look, in the United States, is facing a lot of problems at home, but it's still so aggressive overseas uh, for purely for propaganda purposes, even, you know. But I don't think, you know, mo just more seriously, I don't think, you know, many people actually know what's going on inside the United States domestically. I think, you know, probably most people know that, you know, we are divided, right? It's, it, it's a divided society and we do face a lot of challenges, gun violence, right? And, and even the pandemic, you know, over one million people have died. You know, what has the government done you know, to to you know help to at least to perhaps to decrease the number of people who died? You know, but yeah, but uh, I, I don't. I, that, this is a of course a different issue from uh, our main focus tonight. But I think you know, yes, it's 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 kind of related. You know, maybe people can challenge U.S. foreign policy. You know, why you know you're you're spending so much money? You know, the defense budget is increasing every year. You know. Why don't you use some of the money to fix all these domestic problems, infrastructure, education, healthcare? You know, you can raise a lot of issues, but but this is America. I mean, we've done that for decades, you know, centuries, even, right? So uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, there's some connection here, but I don't, I don't know how to explain it. But I mean, uh, maybe Michael and Joko can can enlighten us. Actually, I would like to um, just return to something that Chihoko said during her talk, which is that um, the United States is so divided on almost every issue, except when it comes to Ukraine, the United States is united. <laughs> so um, also when it comes to China, it's and when it comes to China. Are pretty united, you know. So that's why you know, going back to the earlier early question, you know, Democrat or Republican come into power in four years, two years, it doesn't really matter, you know. I mean, they, they are both going to be tough on China, you know, because to be tough on China is the, the policy of the United States. So that makes no difference who will be in the White House in the future. If, so, I, if I can make 
point? Sure, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, as I began my presentation, I, I emphasized the distinctive role of the Washington foreign policy establishment, which many people call the blob. Uh, and what I and I think we, we I would want to emphasize the disconnect between that elite and the rest of the country. You know, for the most part, I think the American public doesn't focus on these foreign policy issues very much. I, I mean, people wave Ukrainian flags, and there's one in front of our city hall here in Northampton. But but I don't think that 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 represents at the local level uh, or anti-China sentiment either a deeply felt uh, passion. I whereas local issues and and some of the other issues that that the the questioner raised are much closer to home. But we've created a system. Uh, Shikung was was alluding to this, where we allow this foreign policy elite to really make decisions uh, for the rest of us on foreign policy. And they're, they are quite, feel very strongly and passionately about China in particular, as I try to emphasize. So one of the things that we have to think about is how can we make American foreign policy more democratic in the sense that it's more um, reflective of and more responsible to the wider public. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of ways in which, in which American foreign policy is very divergent from the wishes of most Americans. Okay, we have four minutes left. And um, I think I'm gonna read a number of the remaining questions. And while I'm doing that, I wonder if each of you could sort of think about a one minute closing comment you'd like to make. Um, uh, Annette Brownlee asks, why does not the US acknowledge that its bases from the North Indian Ocean through Australia to North Asia clearly threaten China in a way that China does not have parallel threats to the US? Kil Sang Yoon asks, why does the US need adversarial nations dividing the world between us and them? Um, Kil Sang Yoon asks, uh, since the collapse of the USSR, the US has enjoyed the status of unipolar as well as superpower. How long can the United States sustain such a status with the policy of full spectrum dominance over the global community? Isn't it time for the US to learn to live in harmony and cooperation with other nations? Um, David Hartso asks, given the enormity of the challenges of the crises facing the US and China, danger of nuclear war, the COVID pandemic and climate crisis, what are ways to encourage cooperation between the US and China in dealing with these crises? So there's several other questions, but they go a little bit along the same lines as the ones that I've just asked. So you have one minute each to give your final thoughts. Michael, do you wanna begin? Well, I guess I should, I'll go, we'll go in the order we spoke. And um, I'd like to answer David Hartso's question. Uh, one of the principles of our committee, uh, Committee for Sane US-China Policy, is to seek cooperation between the US and China on climate change. Um, the other panelists have spoken about the missed opportunity of, of, of addressing the COVID crisis. Uh, uh, and, and I share that view, but um, where both countries are especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change because of our continental scale and, and long coastlines, and are gonna face utterly devastating consequences. And so we have a mutual interest in cooperating on climate change. And uh, there was movement in that direction at the beginning of the Biden administration, John Kerry met with Chinese officials uh, and that's been lost, but that's something that we could try to resurrect those efforts and make it a, a, a strategy for, for cooperation in the future. Thank you, Michael. Jichun, do you want to make a closing yeah. statement? Yeah, Yeah. okay. Maybe maybe just pick on the uh, question from Ken Blackman, Australia, wonderful. <laughs> uh, you know, so the... Uh, about you know 
I guess you're raising this double standards issue here, you know, or hypocrisy, whatever, you, how you define, you know. Yes, I mean, uh, you look at the, the, just look at the map, of course, you know, you realize that the China is surrounded by uh, US allies and all these military bases clearly aimed at China, or sometimes they say at the North Korea, right? Uh, but, the, but how does China threaten the United States? I think that's the question many, many people in China are asking, you know. I think that question has to be answered by, you know, US strategic uh, planner, you know, and US government officials and members of Congress, you know, how do you explain that, right? I mean, the question also reminds me of uh, what happened recently with this agreement between China and Solomon Islands, right? Near Australia, you know. Uh, so United States and Australia both viewed it as a threat to uh, security in the South Pacific. Uh, again, you see double standards over there, right? I mean, I, we don't have time to, uh, to expand on that, you know. Uh, anyway, I, in closing, I would, I would say, you know, I think from the, the Ukraine and Russia crisis, one of the lessons we can learn, or at least I, 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 I've learned is that peace is most valuable. And war, you know, is is disasters, and 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 it's it's not too distant from us actually. So the biggest lesson is that it's not whether China will attack Taiwan or whether the United States will come to Taiwan's defense. I think the real biggest lesson is that how every party involved can do their utmost to avoid war and promote peace, be it in Ukraine or potentially in the Taiwan Strait in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Shihoko, do you want to have the last word here? Oh, the pressure's on, right? Um, <laughs> the, so just going back to what the theme of tonight um, about talking about the consequences of, of Ukraine and how that in, influences US-China relations, there, the United States has really embraced the role of a leader in, in leading the charge of an international coalition and taking a stance against Russia uh, protecting Ukraine. Um, and that has been welcome, but I don't think it's going to be a sustainable model um, given that the world that we live in now is um, so fractured. It is not a us versus them. This is not the reemergence of the Cold War. Uh, there is a lot of frustration with the United States, the question about, you know, the, the domestic turmoil that the United States faces, that doesn't make America a terribly attractive place for a lot of countries uh, right now. There's a lot of questioning about US leadership. So we are seeing a shift in uh, global values. We are seeing certainly a change in the um, uh, hierarchy and the regional order, especially in Asia, uh, China, uh, rightly wants to have a claim uh, that matches the, its own military and economic standing, and this conflict will continue. But it's not going to end by one Beijing garnering support from one from its, its countries, and then the United States continuing to to hunker down with its own allies. We're going to see a, a, a meshing of of when there are specific interests, they will, they will lead to other um, networks and partnerships. And so there is not going to be this clear cut divide and we're going to be living in shades of gray from now on. Thank you so much. We do have to close now. It is 8.33, but I urge everybody to go to our website. Um, it's been posted in the chat several times and you can subscribe to our newsletter and we hope to see you at future events. Thank you all very much for coming and thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Avi, for your help in moderating. Thank you all. This was so interesting. <laughs>